Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast. Why is FRAR compliance so difficult, or are we just overcomplicating things? Sponsored by Bulwark. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine. I'll be your moderator today. Thanks for joining us. From our team here at the National Safety Council, which is working remotely, we sincerely hope that you are all safe and healthy amid the global COVID-19 pandemic. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some housekeeping items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speaker. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. You can feel free to ask your question at any time at all during today's presentation. You don't have to wait until the start of the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not get to every question today. Any questions we don't get to, however, will be forwarded along to our speaker. If you happen to have any technical issues during this webcast, please refer to our list of helpful tips on the right-hand portion of your screen. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located at the bottom of your screen. And today, our friends at Bulwark have made all the slides from our presentation available, and you can find those today under the Resources widget. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, which I'll tell you more about later. Finally, this webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, just visit our website. We're at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our presenter. Our speaker today, and the man who's going to uncomplicate this topic for us all, is Derek Sang who serves as the Technical Training Man Manager at Bulwark Protection. For more than 20 years, Derek has been involved in the FR, FR clothing industry in a variety of roles in the service, manufacturing, and garment sides of the business. Derek also stands above the crowd as an educator and a speaker. He's developed more than 250 informational and educational seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire. He has also produced more than 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University that cover a wide range of FR clothing topics. In addition, Derek is also a published author with articles focused on multiple different FR AR subjects. Again, we thank you all for tuning in today. And Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Barry, thank you for that kind introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning and or good afternoon, depending uh, if you're listening to us live or in the archive format. So let's get started. Why is FR and AR, so those acronyms, flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing compliance, so difficult, or are we just overcomplicating things? Let's get into the meat and potatoes. First and foremost, got to get the attorneys out of, out of the way. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protection does not make any representation that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So on to it. The premise. When we're out in the field and when we're talking to our end user community and when we're taking uh, questions from our customers about their end user community, we receive a lot in and around how to properly wear flame resistant arc rated clothing. And they get questions such as, well, what's better, a task based approach, a daily wear approach? How do we ensure our people wear flame resistant arc rated clothing, and et cetera? So, today, in this short time together, we're going to touch on uh, why. Why is there resistance to flame-resistant arc-rated clothing? What are some best practices to improve buy-in? Uh, how FRAR science is leading 
uh, in, in compliance? And what are the pros and cons of daily wear, daily wear versus task-based programs? And really, uh, flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, it's not complicated. Uh, what is complicated is culture. And we'll talk a little bit of some things that can help move you through that from a strategic standpoint. So why is there resistance to flame-resistant arc-rated clothing? One word, hot. In fact, you can emphasize that and say it's too hot. It's heavy. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't fit well. I don't like it. I'm not going to wear it. And the tens of other variations that you all on this uh, webinar today probably hear, have said, or participate in. People tend to think then, if it's PPE, and those are the conditions that I have to deal with, those are my resistors, why don't you just put it on when you need it? Plain and simple, I avoid one, two, and three. Just wear it when you need it, take it off when you don't. Sounds like a very good solution. Unfortunately, when you are wearing and you should be wearing 100% industrial cotton workwear to begin with, if you're going to adopt this approach, putting on a minimum of a 7 ounce or a 9 ounce flame resistant arc rated coverall over top of your existing workwear, you've just made it hotter. You have just made it heavier. In fact, coveralls are not designed to be leading fashion statements, so they're not going to fit well because they're for a general body composition. So you've, in fact, enhanced every one of those three resistors that you have currently taken on. So how do you encourage compliance when it's hot, whatever that hot is, whether it's my ambient air temperature outside that I'm working in, or it's inside the facility that I'm working in, or it's inside my head. The short answer is wear trials and training. Single layer flame resistant arc rated clothing does not, and I repeat, does not trap heat or restrict heat removal any more than regular non-FR clothing. You want to reference a really good article back May 1, 2019 in OHS? It's right there, the truth and heat stress in and around flame-resistant clothing. Heat is shed primarily by evaporation, particularly when the ambient air temperature gets higher than our body temperature. That's in and around 98 degrees. The restriction or the inability to sweat due to the environment is ultimately what causes heat stress. When you look at NIOSH and OSHA studies on the contributors to heat stress, the three big factors are hydration, shade, correct, and clothing is all the way down around number seven or eight, depending on what you're looking at. Now, that does not factor in when we layer up. And why would we have to layer up? Well, if we're climbing into an arc flash suit because we're now getting into a 25, 30 calorie hazard versus our less than eight calorie daily wear hazard, we're layering up. Now it does factor in. If we have to wear disposable or lightweight tie cam type products, products that have soil resistance, chemical resistance, and also have flame resistant properties, those are going to typically be membranes or barriers. Even simple things like putting on a arc rated ANSI compliant vest for visibility, those tend not to breathe as well as daily wear clothing. We've added reflective tape. We've added a bunch of other things, and now we've put on additional wear in those areas. Yes, we can have contributors to heat stress. And don't forget, it can also be hot even if there is a summer storm. Ambient air temperature, 75 degrees, that sounds comfortable, but when I don my rain gear, now I've just introduced a membrane a barrier and I'm going to interfere with that removal of heat that I'm trying to mimic with my single layer clothing. So the statement single layer flame resistant arc rated clothing is no more or less 
a contributor to heat stress is tr is true until we have to start layering in our PPE world. So with that being said, how do I break that barrier? How do I convince my people to do things that are going to enhance safety, enhance compliance, yet may intuitively be getting pushback because they think they're adding to heat or they're going to be uncomfortable? Things like, how do I ensure that people wear their seat belt properly? What do you mean seat belt? I thought we were talking about flame resistant. Art. Your last line of defense in an auto wreck is your seat belt. Whether you're wearing it or you're w and wearing it properly directly correlates to how you'll come out of that event. I can give you the best PPE on the planet, but if you don't deploy it properly, it will not work. If I don't, I can give you the best fall harness on the planet, and if you don't attach that D-ring, it will not work. If your thigh straps are loose and flopping around, your chest rig is not snug down. It doesn't matter how good the PPE is out of the box. If I don't deploy it properly, it will not work. No different when it comes to our flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. In fact, all our standards tell you how to properly wear it. For arc flash, whether you're NFPA 70E or ASTM 1506, whether you're utility or general industry, you interface a shirt and pant properly. That's a fancy way of saying tuck them in, roll them down, button them, button them to the neck. Not up to the neck, but to the neck. And in our flash fire standards, right in 2113, it dictates that you must have full body coverage as much as reasonably possible, and if you are utilizing shirts and pants that they are tucked in, buttoned down, etc. So our standards give us some leverage there because it will not protect you as well as it could if you are not interfacing it correctly. So what are we doing to help? And by we, it's the collective we as manufacturers and contributors of this PPE as you consume this PPE. What are we doing to make flame-resistant arc-rated garments uh, better to wear so we can break down that barrier? So we are doing things like looking at lighter weight materials. We are looking at moisture wicking, high air permeability, moisture wear, wear, uh, vapor transfer. We're looking at all those things that should sound familiar because all those commercials you hear on TV about high performance fabrics, performance based fabrics, we are starting to incorporate that technology into the personal protective world. Just know this, it is a little there is a little nuance in there. Not everything that's directly available in retail directly correlates or transfers to the PPE world. There we are. Comfort is not weight dependent. The two main contributors to comfort are how much air can flow through and how much moisture can I wick. Remember, when we are talking about comfort in the uh, a working environment, we're talking about evaporation. We're talking about mimicking the body's ability to sweat and, and cool off. So the, as I can get moisture away from my body and out to the atmosphere so it can evaporate off, the more my fabric can contribute to that functionality, the cooler I'm going to be. So yes, we will see lightweight mentioned here a couple of times, but understand in and of itself, not a single one of these characteristics as a standalone correlates to comfort. It's a balance between the three. And we add an additional caveat in that balance because I need to protect you first. I have to protect for it doesn't matter how good I do everything else in a short duration thermal event, whether that's arc flash or flash fire, I first and foremost have to protect you from getting a second degree burn. If I can achieve that, then I can start now manipulating these other factors to enhance and ultimately lead to comfort. Lightweight sounds good and reasonable out of the box, but remember, the lighter, 
of that fabric, the less there is to do the work. The less there is to do the work in protection, the less there is to do the work in moisture wicking, the less there is to do in creating that open weave because if I get too light, I have to make the weave tighter in order to protect you. So we, as that collective, are working at manipulating all these factors. So as we look to make garments more comfortable and break down the perception of heat, compliance is going to start with the fabric. Open weave, increasing breathability, which is a fancy marketing way of saying allowing air to flow through. We want to do that. We also, when we get lighter, we want to make it still durable so that we're not going to burn through these very expensive garments in six to eight months. We want to have moisture wicking as a component of the fiber matrix, not an additional finish. We want to be able to move moisture and dry quickly and improve thermal regulation by a combination of air permeability and moisture management. So we are looking at all these things to ultimately create true performance workwear for, lack of a better name, an occupational athlete. So we're taking a lot of what is happening in the retail performance side and trying to mimic it as best we can based on the restrictions in protection first because not everything directly transfers from performance retail into the PPE realm. That's why fabric weight in and of itself is not an indicator of comfort. Uh, another way to look at it is think of automobiles. Uh, when we first had uh, needing to protect auto drivers and we had heavier weights of metal, there was a lot of protection there. But how do you go faster? You go faster by keeping the same power plant and everything the same. You need to get lighter. So what did they start doing? They started using lighter and lighter metals. Well, the protection got less and less. And it wasn't until we started introducing high-density uh, plastics and et cetera and creating equal protection in lighter weight that we were able to get faster. So here we want to maintain the same level of protection, that magic number that we all talk about, CAT2, eight calories of protection. We, we all want to do that, but instead of doing it at seven and a half ounces, we want you all to do it at five and a half ounces. Sounds good in theory, and still you have to start manipulating all these factors. The cool thing is we really are getting there. We've had some excellent uh, revolutionary new chemistry that's been introduced. We're able now to capture synthetic fibers that haven't been avail available to the marketplace before. So we're able to get that weight down, plus factor in moisture wicking component, air permeability, and improve moisture vapor transfer at the end of the day, which is going to make the wear cooler, which ultimately is going to lead to uh, better compliance. That all being said, what do we see currently when we're at our end user facilities? What are some of the things that we see our safety folks getting challenged with? Well, believe it or not, 14 ounce and 12 ounce denim is not a restrictor. We don't get a lot of pushback from the waist down. We don't get a lot of comments, pants are too hot, pants are too uncomfortable, pants this or that. All the pushback comes from the waist up. It's, it's in the shirt weights, it's, this is too itchy, too uncomfortable, et cetera, everything that we've already had. So what does that tend to lead to when it's from the waist up? That goes back to the mindset of, hey, just put it on when you need it. That's a task-based solution. Well, the problem with task-based is we tend to then lead to overprotecting. We tend to lead to a NFPA 70E uh, table mentality or a simplified two-step approach mentality or just don a flash suit. Well, there's no need to don a flash suit for a 12 calorie job when you your only options at 25 or a 40 calorie fast flash suit you can build a system that'll protect the 12 calories that is far lighter but if you are in a task-based mentality you can't do that 
The other thing is, is how do you go to work to, in the day to dawn those task-based environments? Can we be indirectly or able to police what multiples we're introducing into a task-based world? I work during the day. I go to do an energized task. I'm going to climb into my PPE. The mindset is, is my PPE will protect me, so it doesn't matter what I wear underneath when we all know that that is fallacy. What you wear underneath has to be, at a bare minimum, natural fibers. Are we coaching that all the way through the process, or do we have the opportunity here because of lack of training, or we forget our training, or we just didn't remember our training, that we could be introducing multiples? Can we be wearing non-compliance over the top? For example, we go to the tool room, we grab a high-vest vest. Well, are all the vests in the tool room flame-resistant and arc-rated to our hazards? Do we have non-FR vests in the tool rooms? Do we have vests that aren't tested to the hazard? Do we stop the hierarchy of controls at admin and don't drill all the way down to PPE? I say that and everybody's flinching on the, uh, on the, the webinar because, of course, we don't. Where do we see that? Combustible dust hazards. Why? The majority of combustible dust webinars and training that you will sit in walk all the way down to housekeeping and don't address PPE. A combustible dust hazard is a chain reaction flash fire. In fact, if you read through the combustible dust standards, they reference NFPA 2112 compliant garments if you have a combustible dust hazard as your PPE. So as your last line of defense is PPE, it's not admin. So just because nothing bad has happened doesn't make what you're doing right or safe. You've all heard the term Compliance doesn't necessarily equal safety. Safety is a culture. Safety is a mindset. Compliance is a checklist. Yes, I can be compliant if I check the list. Do you have PPE? Yes, we have a CAT 2 flash suit, a CAT 4 flash suit. We have enough of them in enough sizes and variations that all our folks doing electrical have access to them. Are you technically compliant? If I can walk you to my locker room and say, yes, my electrical people have access to all the PPE they need, and there are your flash suits either in your hot kits or hanging, are you compliant? Arguably, you could say yes. Are you safe? I have no idea. I don't know if they're deploying them every single time they're doing an energized task, voltage testing, troubleshooting, and verifying. I don't know if all the equipment's labeled correctly so that they know whether they're picking into their CAT2 flash suit or their CAT4 flash suit. I don't know if they have an understanding of the tables in order to interpret that kind of task-based approach. So you could argue that you're compliant, but not necessarily safe. So where did you go wrong if you have a task-based mentality, meaning that yes, I'm protecting my people. Yes, I want to protect my people. Yes, this is the approach you've done. So you have a program in place, and you gave everyone the necessary tools to get the job done and what happens. It just takes one person, as we all know, that old poison the well. One bad apple spoils the bunch to save some time, set, and repeat, meaning that nothing bad happened. Others see this and replicate it and want to emulate it because, hey, you got a pat in the bag for, you know, cutting 20 minutes or an hour or a day or we're a week ahead of schedule, whatever it may see. Then by the time you have new hires and new transfers, next thing you know that, that your, your culture is getting diluted to where it was once very robust to where it doesn't take long for that to get out of whack. Because this is the way we do things around here. Next thing you know, your unsafe practices have become part of your culture. When doing wrong seems right, or what they've called or labeled the normalization of deviation, when people routinely perform negative yet danger, repetitive yet dangerous tasks, it's very easy to become desensitized to the inherent risk of what could happen, especially if you keep doing them and nothing goes wrong. 
It was first coined by socialist Diane Vaughn when reviewing the Challenger disaster. If you go back and read the reports on what happened there, very, very smart people knew for a very, very long time there was an inherent flaw in that system. But it worked until it didn't. And that insensitivity occurs insidiously and sometimes over years because the disaster doesn't bring it to light. So that deviation typically occurs because the barriers to using the correct process are things like time, got to get it done, cost, don't add cost to the project, or taking too long increases the cost, or doing it right, and then ultimately our peer-to-peer -peer pressure. So we've talked about our hierarchy of controls. Remember, what I am talking about is the last line and the least effective defense mechanism in all your protocols. We want to eliminate that hazard. We want to substitute for it, engineer it out, administrative controls, and then we have still our PPE on. We don't want to be relying on our PPE. But understand this, that's all fine and good until you have the event. When that short duration thermal event, whatever that is, arc flash, flash fire, is happening, everything else has failed. You cannot go back now and change anything. Your PPE, as it's worn, as it's deployed, how it sits on you is going to directly correlate to how you come out of that event. You heard me reference this earlier. Your last line of defense in that accident is your PPE. Just like that safety belt, and the reason 70 years after it was invented we still use it is because it's a proven life-saving piece of equipment. Even with all the engineering we have around us, we've got I don't know how many airbags in automobiles today, but there are more than two. We have side view mirrors that are notifying if there's something in our blind spot. We have sensor arrays that will put our boat in the water, park our car, and brake for us if we're too slow. But we are still required to click it or tick it. Again, proven life-saving piece of equipment. No matter how bad it is on this side of the windshield, it's better than 25 feet down that asphalt. Ask any highway patrol officer the safety, uh, the probability of ejection accidents. It's virtually nil. If you have an arc flash or a flash fire event, your last line of defense are the clothing on your back. And is it made of self-extinguishing fabrics that are going to mitigate the injury? And are you wearing it correctly? Zipped up, buttoned down, tucked in will directly correlate how you come out of that event. How much human that we get involved has now started to take or come to the forefront after many, many years of understanding it's there. Human performance, however you want to label that and identify that, is a key factor in accidents. Annex G and 70E, which we pulled from the Canadian uh, version, 462 to sit there and tell us that, hey, humans are very important in what happens in the workplace. Human performance adrenaline is managing things like human error, recognizing it. People are fallible. The annex just says the concept of human performance to identify and address human error. What are some of the things that they talk about? Task demands, your work environment, individual capabilities, and human nature. What are those? Things like time pressure high workload, uh, distractions or interruptions, and that can be both on your personal life or in the work environment. Individual capabilities, is this new equipment? I may be the best at doing X and you bring in the latest version and you've changed the software, I may have no idea how to, how to work on that piece of equipment so I can go from a qualified electrician to unqualified real quick, but if I don't alert you of that, or if you don't ask, or we don't have a process in place to identify that, could my ego possibly be writing a check that I cannot cash? So those are things that we start to think about. How does humans show up on the job? 
Well, if you look at 15, 20, and 50, shortcuts, overconfidence, not following procedure. Has that ever shown up on one of your post-event evaluations? 65% of stuff on there we're well, of it, well aware of. It happens on a consistent basis. So how do we combat human? As we're going through this webinar, we're talking about complicating FR, AR clothing. So what are some of the things uncomplicated? If I could have a baseline of protection, regardless of what I'm going to do, and if I had a baseline of protection that was deployed or better yet for this example, worn correctly all day, every day, at least if something went awry, I'm going to mitigate that injury as opposed to what could be a very, very unfortunate outcome if I was wearing the wrong stuff and I forgot to get into the right stuff because we had that task-based mentality. What am I talking about? Daily wear is a baseline level of protection to combat not just human factors such as complacency, lack of sensitivity to the hazard or normalization of deviance that we just talked about. It also provides a last line of defense when as we talk about the hierarchy of controls have there either not been followed or failed. That's a baseline for the employer to at least know there's a certain level of protection. Eight calorie clothing in a 12 calorie arc flash will still perform. It'll still perform its base duty of self extinguishing, not melting and not contributing to the injury. Hence, if I'm wearing it and wearing it correctly, even though I'm technically should have been a, had additional protection, that's better than wearing my 100% cotton because I went to take a look before I climbed into my flash suit. Hence, I'm now on fire and I'm getting excessive body burn all because of not having daily wear or not having a baseline of protection. So when we look at educating at our end user level, the biggest thing that we talk about is understanding how secondary protective clothing works into a systematic approach to PPE. What do I mean by that? If we have a secondary world, we must have a primary world. What's the primary world? Very easy. That's your arc flash suits. That's your uh, silver uh, casting room suits. That's all the stuff that you put on knowingly going into a thermal event. Think about a firefighter. Easiest analogy, big red truck, flashing red lights, burning building. I probably already donned the lower half and upper half of my bunker gear. I, if I put on my special gloves. I've got my special footwear. Before I grab my really cool hard hat, I have one other important piece of PPE to don my breathing apparatus. Why? It doesn't matter how good all that PPE is, I need to be able to breathe in a long-term exposure to thermal energy. I need to be able to work inside that fire. I don all that equipment, grab my pole axe, and voluntarily walk into a burning building. Once that fire's knocked down and we're all back at the station house, all that PPE is getting cleaned. I don't need to be wearing it. Why? Because it's task-based. I'm knowingly going into a thermal event. In the industrial world, there is no knowing. You're working in an area where there's an accidental potential or a potential for accidental exposure to thermal energy. So when do you have to be wearing your PPE? All the time. Unless we equip folks with crystal balls so they can avoid being there when there's a thermal exposure, we don't build electrical equipment to blow up, and we don't build our uh, gas, oil refining, oil and G, petrochem world to have flash fires. So we don't have time to go get it. We need to be wearing it all the time. So how does this kind of creep into our world? We have knowingly taken this information said, agreed, agreed. We're going to have a baseline. Now that we've implemented the program and we've trained our folks, how are they wearing it in the field? 
this is where we see it creeping in. This is where compliance starts to get tough because technically, yes, I have my PPE. Yes, I've got it deployed, but is it correct? Back to wearing that seatbelt. I remember back, and I'm dating myself, when my dad first got his car with a, a seat belt with that little dinger that kept going off, he simply took that safety belt and snapped it behind his back. Stop that annoying ding, 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 and he continued down the highway. Here we have PPE deployed in the, in the field. What could go wrong here? Is this shirt underneath his arc-rated shirt, is it also arc-rated? Because now it's exposed. So it has to be equal to or greater than the potential incident energy he may receive in, in, in an arc flash, because now that's technically the outermost layer. What about his buddy behind him? I don't know how many on the phone have heard of the chimney effect, but that's when thermal energy rises from the ground up underneath our arc rated flame res or flame resistant arc rated shirt and ignites what's underneath. Why? Hot air follows the laws of thermodynamics. It rises. So if my arc flash shoots to the ground, mushrooms, all that hot air comes up, I've now given it a pathway. And if I'm wearing 100% cotton underneath there, which I'm allowed to do, I have fuel that is exposed to hot, hot air and gases. Could it ignite? It takes about 400 degrees to ignite cotton. In addition, we're also challenged because some standards are not enough, and some are just wrong. So now you've built your base layer, now you've built your daily wear, now you put your people out into the elements. They have to get rain gear, or they have to get high visibility uh, vests in order to, well, those are now the outermost layer. Those have to be built to and for and tested to your hazards, whether that's arc flash or flash fire. So when you look at your vests and you see only one, one standard reference to claim FR properties, that is not enough. You have no idea how those garments are going to perform, and they are now the outermost layer. Example, ASTM uh, 2302 was removed until they reconfigured it to reference it's not a standalone uh, standard in and of itself to tell you enough information of whether or not it will work in the hazard. Why? The marketplace was abusing that and creating flame resistant and marketing flame resistant vests and rain gear to meet 2302. 2302 is just a heat resistant flame resistant standard and if you read it it says not to be used in arc flash or flash fire. ASTM 6413 is the big one now. People are claiming we passed 6413. We are self-extinguishing. It is meaningless in an arc flash and a flash fire as a standalone. In fact, it gives you zero confidence in how it will perform in an arc flash or a flash fire. It just tells you it passed a vertical flame test, and plastic passes a vertical flame test because you don't get any char length, you don't get any after flame, you don't get any ignition. So how confident if that's your only standard? It's a precessor to do a whole ton more work in order to get the right stuff. And NFPA 701, most of you have heard of or should have heard of, that is not even a garment standard. It's a drapery standard and a linen standard. The right ones for arc flash are ASTM 1891 for rain gear and ASTM 2733 for flash fire rain gear. In our high vis vest world, look for ASTM 1506. Better yet, if it has an arc rating in there, then you know it's been, it being at least tested to an arc flash can do that. This is some of the nonsense that you will see out there. Here we say it meets 6413, it self extinguishes. What does that matter? You can't use it in an arc flash or a flash fire because why? ANSI told you that 6413 is not one of the standards allowed to claim flame resistant properties. So this particular label tells you it's not flame resistant. Then down here on the same label, it tells you it is flame resistant because it says type R class 2 FR. Then over here, if you read the fine print itself, self extinguishing characteristics that they state will wear out. So if this was on rain gear, that's rain gear you can't get wet. 
So be very, very cautious on looking for those outer layers, getting beyond and into additional safety components. So how not to overcomplicate things. Have daily wear. Have a baseline of protection for every one of your people that are exposed to short duration thermal events. Make sure it's appropriate to the hazard and it's been tested to your hazards. Base layer, and we have a whole segment on training folks just on base layers and base layer compliance, but for ease of use, non-meltables. That is cotton, wool in the, in the, uh, the winter time, and silk, those are natural fibers. Better yet, get into flame resistant arc rooted base layers. They're always gonna be more protective. You can look at being lighter two layers, hence more comfort, and we can definitely have a discussion on that. Uh, do your homework. It doesn't take a lot of effort to figure out if this stuff is the correct stuff, built for the hazards, all the cert certificates are in line, all the claims are in line. And find your own subject matter expert. The great thing about this marketplace is most of the technical folks are more than happy to share their knowledge, regardless of brand. We're a very small community, uh, but we want our end user communities to be safe. So find someone that you can trust. So with that, how do we simplify it? Everything that you, you read on arc flash protection, just understand you wanna have more arc rating than incident energy. Incident energy is measured in calories per centimeter squared. Your arc rating is measured in calories per centimeter squared. What it tells you it will blow up at, you want to have more to insulate and protect you, i.e. incident energy. If that gray box or if that overhead line or that pad mount transformer, when the engineers do their work, tell you that that's five, six, seven calories, have more on your outermost layer. That's all you have to do from a simplification standpoint. 70E for our uh, general industry electricians, it's real easy. Between 1.2 calories and 12 calories, wear garments that are equal to or greater than the incident energy you're exposed to. This is because you know your incident energies. This is why that uh, arc flash hazard assessment gets done so you can dress with less. That's ultimately, regardless if you use the simplified two-step approach or the tables, if you know your incident energies, if you've done your study, typically nine times out of 10, you will be working with less PPE because those tables are very conservative. For 2112 on our flash fire uh, hazard world, Specified 2112 compliant garments. Why is that? Because all the fabrics have been tested to uh, multiple laundering, so the FR durability is there. Everything that goes into making them has passed, and all the facilities get audited. That means we can't contract it out. That means I can't win your business based on this prototype and then sub it out and reduce my cost. I have to do it right every single time. Because if you don't at least do 2112, what are you allowing on your facility? And when it tells you it's built for a short duration thermal event, such as fat flash fires, dust fires, et cetera, what else would you want on your facility? So look for 2112 compliant garments because based on what we know today, it gives you peace of mind. Uh, you don't need to choose 2112, but if you don't, why didn't you? If you're not going to use 2112, what are you going to use? It's built to your hazard. So again, don't overcomplicate things. Uh, get a committee together. I know everybody says, here's the old joke. Here's the shirt decided by a committee. It's got zippers. It's got... No, getting your people to participate is going to minimize pushback. Evaluate and select the best and latest garments. It's evolving all the time. In my intro, you heard I've been in this for 25 years. Yes, I started back when you could get any style, any color of navy blue Nomex coverall you wanted, because that's all we had. The way it's changed just in the last five years, it's dramatically different. So if you have not recently evaluated what's out there, get out and take a look. Uh, 
tour the manufacturing mills and, and areas where possible. Conduct proper wear trials. And this is a lot of places where people make simple mistakes. For example, and then one more slide and we'll move on to questions. If I get my 10 guys together and we bring in three or four shirts, three or four pants, most people, hey, I don't need to teach you how to wear a pant. But when you put that shirt on and you're used to wearing 100% cotton, frugal, loom, BVD or whatever underneath your work shirt because that's what you've always done and that's what you're trained. When you're going through my wear test, what are you wear testing? You're wear testing your 100% cotton BVD or frugal loom undergarment except from the elbow down. That's what you're basing your evaluation on. So again, find people who are comfortable wearing the fabric for this short duration test. Coach your people, find the right people, find a good cross section and work on those things and then design the right questions to give you an accurate outcome. Include outerwear, rain wear and high, high vis if that's part of your needs. Uh, industrial launderers, wash at home, hydrant programs, the flexibility in today's marketplace to take care of all the cleaning and uh, maintenance needs you all need, pretty flexible, a lot more variation than we've had in the past. And then roll out training as part of your 1910-132 compliance. Get them all trained up on how to properly don, doff, wear, et cetera, and it can all be done. With that, there's my contact information. Don't hesitate to take my email. Send me out all your thoughts, all your ideas. I'm more than happy to share with you uh, what I've seen, what I've worked on. Uh, we at Bulwark, we do free training to do that last piece to help roll out programs. Heck, I will train you on my competitor's shirts, pants, and coveralls if that's what you're wearing because the training's what's the important piece. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Barry. We've got time for a few questions. And as Barry said, if we don't get to them all today, more than happy. They send me all those. You will get a reply from me at some point. Thank you again for all your time. Great job, Derek. Thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with us today. We're going to let Derek catch his breath just for a moment before we start the questions, but I want to share a couple of reminders with you all. Remember, if you'd like to ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. I also want to remind everyone that Bulwark has made the slides available. They are under your Resources widget, so feel free to check those out. I uh, also want to remind you all that uh, the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete today, the survey should be appearing on your screen right now. Your feedback is really important to us. It does help us improve all our future webcasts. And if you do not see the survey on your screen, please go ahead and turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the evaluation by clicking on the survey button, which is near the lower right portion of your screen. Now let's go ahead and get to some questions. Derek, we have a ton for you today, uh, as we always do. Uh, first question from Fred. He wants to know, does the jacket for FRAR rainwear need to be tucked into the pant? Interesting question. Uh, and after all I've just told you about tucking stuff in, the answer is going to be no. And here's why. Because what you're wearing underneath is going to be interfaced correctly per what I said, and or in many cases, a lot are designed with bibs. So that bib coming up underneath and the outer jacket, there's no need to tuck that in. And secondly, my rainwear guys uh, would all argue that they're not designed to be interfaced that way. So when we talk about single layer interfacing, we're talking about a shirt and a trouser or a shirt and a pant as they would commonly be known and would be interfaced. So the assumption, and again, we all know what happens when we assume, but I'm going to assume that your shirt and pant are interfaced correctly before you don your flame-resistant arc-rated rainwear. All righty. We're going to go to uh, Eduardo next to his question. Uh, he mentions that the ANSI and the OSHA standards aren't super clear when it comes to FR requirements uh, for welding apparel. Could you discuss a little bit about uh, minimum requirements for welding gear? So uh, 
the easy answer is we have not done a very, very good job here in the United States to give guidance to our welders beyond uh, respiratory requirements and the basic PPE of not melting, dripping, and adding to the injury. So we've defaulted in many cases because of the rough nature of that task on clothing to 100% cotton. Uh, the problem is, is 100% cotton is just latent fuel waiting for enough energy to ignite it. So what will happen in those cases is a big hunk of slag will fall into a fold and slowly smolder there until uh, it ignites. And in many cases, our welders, by nature, are myopic because their job, their reputation, everything is in how solid that bead is. They could have a clothing fire long before they've even recognized uh, that they're in trouble. And in many cases, it's our welder's helper or someone else on the job site that's telling our welder that he's on fire. That's a long-winded way of saying we need to do better. We know we should have self-extinguishing flame-resistant properties in our gear. We know that gear is going to cost a little bit more. So we need to take the next step because there is nothing stopping us from doing better than what the standards tell us to do. Remember, standards across the board, every standard I've mentioned is a bare minimum. That's the bare how to satisfy the law. The law is that you shall do this. The bare minimum is a standard. So yes, we know what the hazard is. Yes, we know what the solution is. We just need to go into that culture shift and make that happen. All right, we have a question now from Amy, uh, who's asking if you could share some examples of natural fibers when it comes to FR. So there are, so let me just take a step back and kind of, so when we talk about natural fibers, as I alluded to it during the webinar, I'm talking about what you wear underneath. So that would be 100% cotton t-shirt, that would be wool as a natural fiber, and then also silk as a natural fiber when we're looking at undergarments and what the standards allow. When we're looking at making FR fabrics, we're utilizing a variety of fibers. There's really three different ways that self-extinguishing uh, engineering can be created at the fiber form. One, we change the molecular formula of the fiber, AKA we take nylon, which we know is a meltable, and we tweak the formula, and guess what we end up with? We end up with Nomex. That is a fiber that will not sustain combustion, and we can weave garments out of it. Or we take a mode acrylic, which we have in our carpets, in our drapes, in our automobiles, and before, while it's still a soup, before we extrude it into a fiber, we take a bunch of fire retardant chemicals, we pour it into that soup, so when we extract that fiber, it now has flame resistant properties. We can also take a natural fiber like rayon, like uh, lyocil, like cotton, and we can put it, which is, it's latent fuel, then we can put it through a bath and we can impart FR properties into that and we can embed those properties through chemical reaction into those fat fibers and ultimately fabrics. So we can have a molecular solution, a fiber solution, and a fabric solution. All three of them if they come from reputable supply chain partners, will do exactly the same. And what is that? They will self-extinguish once the ignition source is gone. They will not melt, drip, and add to the injury. And after a short duration of thermal exposure, they'll ultimately save your life. What we have today is a combination of those and a bunch of support fibers that don't even have flame-resistant properties. Because as we're looking at finding that magic formula, there is no magic fiber or fabric to date, so everybody is manipulating the percentage of how much FR fibers do we need in here? What's our FR engineering going to be? What kind of support fibers can we utilize that at the end of the day, we still self-extinguish, so we protect you. If it's, a, if it's a five calorie arc, I wanna give you six, seven, eight calories of protection. I wanna be lightweight, moisture wicking, air permeability, 
make your latte in the morning, whatever you want to say, we want all these characteristics, but we are still challenged with the most utmost responsibility, and that's saving your life if there's a short duration thermal exposure. A lot of folks take, chal take liberties because they just hope you never need it to protect your life. At the end of the day, as I tell folks, I can put 10 people wearing 10 Navy coveralls and I take and take all the identification off of them. And if I walk them through my facility, I can't tell you which one's better than the other one. You won't know until you need it and then it's too late to find out which ones were not made to protect first and foremost. So hopefully that, that answers uh, Amy's question. Okay, thanks for the explanation, Derek. Uh, I wanted to share, uh, David has a little uh, background here and then a question for you. He says, FR is now available in retail stores and my workers really want to use their own FR. Uh, we do not want that in our refinery as their outerwear uh, as we don't want them to transport contaminants to the community or back to their homes. And he's asking, how, how do your clients handle this and what advice would you give your clients? How much time do we have left? Okay, <laughs> that is it. that is an excellent question, and I probably am not going to get to all of it. So, I, if you guys could earmark that on there, also, sure. if Absolutely. he has my thing, would love to continue this conversation because it is important. Because when we're working in areas where we know we have contaminants and we don't want those contaminants going outside our walls, we supply a uniform program, we supply a locker room, we supply places for folks to uh, dress and undress and minimize taking those things home. Then we also have this really cool marketplace to where there's access to all this neat stuff. And hey, I'm buying the same brand that you all authorize, but here it is on Amazon, or here it is through Boot Barn, or here it is through this manufacturer's website, isn't it the same stuff and can't I have access to it? Because having choice is one of those things that will enhance and complement compliance. So I say all that to say this, there are liaisons that you can work on and the marketplace has gotten far more flexible. Back in the day, you either did this, 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 or this, and there was only two or three ways you could achieve what you're wanting to achieve. Now, now through lease and clean, high soil programs, uh, choice programs, uh, internal catalog programs, you can still meet with those suppliers, lay out how we want to have this done. Our number one goal is I want my folks to have the choice, but we also don't want it getting outside the gate. Help me design a program. And it may take you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, meshing of gears and a little bit of individuals having to let loose of some control. My bottom line is I haven't seen anybody today marrying up with the right partners, not achieving what their goals are and still supplying with a little bit of give and take a very, very viable program that would satisfy, hey, I feel I've got some choice in this program. I'm not getting saddled with one or two choices, yet I'm not allowing uh, some of this to get outside my control, aka outside the gate, aka 10 years from now, I don't want to feel the complaint that my uh, there's something that's systemic within my family that can be traced back to taking my work apparel home. So all those things definitely factor into it. That is a very oversimplified answer to the question based on our time. But there are ways today that we can, with a little bit of give and take, you can achieve your wearers feeling they have some input and the company still feeling that they have the controls necessary for the program. Hopefully that helped. Okay, absolutely, thank you, Derek. We have time for one more quick one here for you. Um, and it's a question from Nick who asks, uh, do FR pants have to be tucked into boots or can the pants go over the top of the boot? Well, 
I finally got one from my oil and gas exploration guys. If I'm down in the Permian, there's only one way to wear your FR coveralls, and that's with your boots on the outside or them tucked in. Uh, I, I've looked because I've been asked because my there's one segment of the decision-making team that wants me to tell them that there's a cut and true answer to that question, and then there's another segment that says you've never worked a day in oil and gas, otherwise you'd know there's only one way to wear your boots, and that's because I don't want, one, I don't want the lower part of my coverall getting drenched and, and weighing down, and secondly, I don't want all that sloth getting curtailed through everywhere. So long and short of it is, the standards don't give me a lot of guidance. Are you compromising your safety by wearing it one way or the other? And here's, here's kind of the, the thing that I've fallen back on when I've looked at it. What is that boot made of? If that boot has any synthetic in it, I would say, no, put the FR over top of it. If it's leather and good quality thick leather, which most work boots are, then that's the same protection I'm getting from the ankle down. Why would it matter if I'm putting it the other way? Uh, so there are pros and cons to each statement. There are no absolutes because, to be honest with you, I don't think when we wrote the standards that we ever thought that people would be tucking their, their coveralls inside their boots or their pants inside their boots. That being said, unless there's some way to think about some accelerant getting in the boot, if there is a short duration thermal exposure and that could ignite and cause injury that wouldn't have happened before, uh, the way when I talk to my guys who are out in the field, they're wearing it because they're slopping around in that diesel fed mill, that fracking fluid, all that stuff, and they just want to not have to deal with pants getting all embedded in that, and their boots go up to mid-calf, and they seem that that's a reasonable protecting to the greater hazard mindset. And I can't say that they're, they're, they're super wrong. If someone does have information to where I'm off base or I can provide better direction for my folks who have that, my simple answer is there is no, unless there is a meltable introduced from that boot, if it's a heavy-duty leather work boot, Typically, you're looking at some kind of slip-on. Most of the guys that have seen are wearing their square-tooled uh, Ariat work boot. Uh, I don't see a problem with it. But if anybody can shoot me some information to where it can help educate me, I'm fine. So uh, long-winded answer to say there's no clear guidelines. So as long as you're not going to get injured or introduce something to it, I don't see the harm in it. Sounds great, Derek. Thank you for that. And thank you, everyone, for your questions today. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions. But as we've mentioned previously, on all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Derek. Uh, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen and share your input with us. On behalf of everyone here at the National Safety Council, please stay safe and stay healthy. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter, Derek Sang, everyone from our sponsor at Bulwark, and all of you who listened in today. Have a safe day, everyone.